We meditate because there's stress in our lives. The word stress here translates the Pali term dukkha, which can mean anything from very subtle levels of stress all the way to very deep suffering. So whether we feel that we have a lot of suffering in our lives, only a little bit, however you translate the term, that's the problem that makes us want to come and meditate. Because, as the Buddha said, the reason we suffer is not because of uncomfortable or unpleasant things outside — sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. It's because of what we bring to these things, because we can suffer even from pleasant things. It's because we cling. The word clinging, upadana, can also mean feed. We feed on things. And to be in a position where you have to feed is a very unstable position. You always have to worry about your source of food. And your feeding, of course, means not just physical feeding, but also mental and emotional feeding. The mind has this lack. And because of the lack, it wants to fill it up. You need to fill that up a little bit, and then it grows empty again. Our intestinal system is not a sac, it's a tube. Whatever comes in and goes out. And that's the same with the mind's intestinal system. Things come in and they give us a little bit of pleasure, and then it's, the pleasure's gone. We want something new, something new, something new all the time. So it's a bad position to be in, having to feed. Because we identify ourselves as a being, one kind or another. That being has to feed. And then the feeding, of course, creates our sense of who we are, the way we feed, what we feed on. It's a vicious cycle. And so we meditate to get out of this. We're going to work directly on our minds, because the problem is in the mind. It's not out there. So focus on what your mind is doing. See if you can bring the mind to a state of stillness. So we're going to have a sense of satisfaction being here. Because one of the reasons we feel so hungry for everything and we feel so overwhelmed by all the choices out there is because we have this limitless hunger inside. As the Buddha said, even if it rained gold coins, it wouldn't satisfy our desires for sensuality. That's just one kind of desire. There are lots of other desires we have, lots of other hungers we have. So try to get a sense of satisfaction being right here. All of what we're doing here does fall under the Four Noble Truths. We see that there's suffering and there's a cause in the mind, and the solution has to lie in the mind as well. It's always important to remember that the Four Noble Truths form the framework for a right view. In other words, the right understanding about what we're doing. This is a point that a lot of people miss. For most people, it's the three characteristics. That's right view. That's the framework. And then the Four Noble Truths get interpreted inside that framework. In other words, we suffer because we don't realize that things are inconstant or impermanent, or because we don't realize that there's no self, which is one of the interpretations of anatta. If we could only learn the truth of these things, then we wouldn't suffer anymore. We wouldn't have any unrealistic expectations, and we'd be content to just accept the way things are. But the mind doesn't work that way. The mind has its hunger. And if we could just let go, seeing that things are in constant stressful and not self, it would be like saying, you see that food is in constant stressful and not self, so you're not going to eat anymore. Or you'd starve. And before you starve to death, you'd probably say, well, enough of that. And go back to eating again. And that's what the mind does. No matter how much you tell yourself these things out there are not satisfactory, you say, well, that's all I've got. And sometimes that's what Buddhist wisdom is interpreted as, is just being willing to accept, well, this is all we've got, so let's satisfy ourselves with what we've got. But the Buddha realized that the hungers of the mind are a lot deeper than that. And so instead of placing the three characteristics first, he put the Four Noble Truths first, and then the three characteristics, which are actually not characteristics, he called them perceptions, find their role within the Four Noble Truths. 
So in other words, you see that you've got to comprehend suffering, you've got to abandon its cause, you've got to realize the cessation to <clears throat> of suffering, and then you've got to develop the path to its cessation. These are duties we have to do. Duties not in the sense of being imposed on us from outside, but duties are simply building the way things are, the way suffering works and the way its, its end is going to work. If you want to put an end to suffering, this is what you've got to do. If you don't want to put an end to suffering, you're free to go anywhere and do what you want. But if suffering is eating away at you and you really do want to solve this problem, there's no other way. But to follow these duties. The first three duties revolve around dispassion. In other words, to comprehend suffering is to see exactly what is the clinging that constitutes the suffering. And why is it that you like that clinging? Well, again, it's, we're feeding. We feel that we get our satisfaction out of feeding, but the Buddha wants you to see there's suffering inherent in that. And to really see that to the point where you get dispassion. Then you look for why you're clinging, it's because you're thirsty. You crave. That's what you've got to abandon. How are you going to do that? Well, it's through developing the path. The path does is by giving you this alternative source of food, the pleasure, the rapture, the sense of fullness and refreshment that can come from getting the mind into concentration. You want to be able to tap into this, because this is going to be your food on the path. And this is the one duty that doesn't have to do immediately with dispassion. In other words, you've got to have some passion for your concentration. You want dispassion for the craving, you want dispassion for the objects you, that you cling to. In fact, that dispassion is the third noble truth. But to see those things, to develop dispassion in those ways, you've got to have passion for the path first. This is one case where you're not going to just say, well, gee, the, my concentration is in constant stressful, not self. I'm going to let it go. You're actually fighting against those three perceptions. You want to make the mind as constant and as easeful and as much in your control as you can. And at this stage of the path, you apply those three perceptions to other things, anything that would pull you away from the practice of virtue, anything that would pull you away from the practice of concentration. practice of discernment. You see those things as in constant stressful, not self. And these perceptions are there to develop a sense of dispassion. It's only when the path has really completed its work, in other words, it's fully developed, then you let that go too. And you apply, apply the perceptions there to the concentration itself. And then you when you can let go of the concentration, you go beyond it. And the Buddha says there's a property of the deathlessness. That's what he calls it. And if you have passion for that, well, you don't get fully awakened. But the fact that you've touched that means that you've awakened to some extent. This is where it's important to realize that the three <coughs> characteristics or the three perceptions don't cover everything. In other words, this deathless is, in, is not inconstant and it's not stressful. But still, the Buddha says you've got to let go of it. That's why he says, sabbe tammanata, not just sabbe sankara, not just all fabrications, but all, all dhammas, all phenomena, fabricated or not, they're not self. That's the perception you apply to that experience. That's when you're totally free. We can develop this passion for that too. Now it may seem like a, a subtle issue, which is, comes first, the Four Noble Truths of the Three Perceptions. It may sound like it's applicable only at the very end of the path, but it's important to keep this perspective in mind all along the way. One, just to remind yourself, the problem is not with the objects of your awareness, it's with how you relate to them. And two, if you come up with anything that seems constant, seems permanent, 
like a ground of being of some kind, of some deep interconnectedness, a oneness, non-duality. You have to ask yourself, are you still clinging to it? If you are clinging to it, if there's any sense of identity in there at all, there's going to be suffering, no matter how constant it may seem. The fact that you're in a position where you're trying to feed on it, that's where the suffering is. So having these frameworks properly sorted out helps get you past those kinds of wrong releases, as the Buddha would call them. In other words, you think you're released, but you're not. You think you've had something really permanent, but you haven't. So this is your protection. And then finally, of course, the whole question of how to interpret those three perceptions, the tendency to make them metaphysical truths, i.e. characteristics of things as they are, especially if it gets to the idea, question of is there a self, is there no self? The Buddha calls those questions a thicket of views, a wilderness of views, a contortion or writhing of views. In other words, you get entangled. If we had to spend all our days arguing as to whether there is or isn't a self, we'd never be able to practice. We wouldn't have the time, we wouldn't have the opportunity. But the perceptions are just those things, labels that you apply when you need them to develop dispassion. When the dispassion has done its work, you put the labels down. There was a controversy years back in Thailand as to whether Nirvana was self or not self. Someone asked Ajahn Mahabhu, and he said, Nibbana is Nibbana. In other words, you don't apply those perceptions, either one, to Nibbana. That's something that's beyond. But that's because it is total dispassion. There's no clinging there at all. So the clinging is suffering, not because we cling to impermanent things, but because just the act of clinging in and of itself. entails suffering. So keep that in mind, because that's what we're looking for. That's what we're working on as we practice. You're going to cling to the meditation, that's fine for the time being. Remember John Cha's example. Coming back from the market, you've got a banana in your hand. And someone asks you, why are you carrying the banana? He says, I want to eat it. Are you going to eat the peel too? No. Then why are you carrying that? He says, how are you going to answer them? As he said, you answer them out of desire. You desire to give the right answer. And that's what gives rise to the discernment, where you can say, the time hasn't come to let go of the peel. If I let go of the peel now, the banana is going to be mush. So you have some passion for your practice as you try to develop this passion for things that would pull you away. You apply the three perceptions wherever you need to develop that sense of dispassion. When the path is fully developed, we can have dispatch about that too. Because that's what we're working on, is this way the mind relates to things, trying to feed on them all the time. We're such a compulsive feeder that even when we have our first experience of the deathless, we're going to try to feed on that too. It's like a little baby that goes around and sees everything as stuff to put in its mouth. But when you find this, that there really is something where there is no clinging in it, there's no sense of hunger. That's when you realize that the feeding was the problem all along. And that's when you can put everything down. But remember to keep the framework and the contents of the framework in the right order. The three perceptions are just there to help you with the duties of the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths come first, because they alert you as to where the real problem is. And if you keep your eyes on that, then it's hard to go wrong. <laughs>